Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. So let us set the table. You know, who doesn't want to have healthy radiant skin you want that glow from the word go but what's going to put a wrinkle in those plans is milk dr preeti kolkarni here with us today to tell you how dairy can be damaging for your skin dr kolkarni can't wait to dive into this one with you this is a big topic i'm sure the viewers are going to get a ton out of it so appreciate you taking the time to be here happy to be here Jeff. All right, and she's going to be taking some of your questions as well when we open up the doctor's mailbag skincare edition. So if you have anything on your mind related to dairy and your skin, go ahead and post that in the comment section now. We will be taking as many questions as humanly possible before the end of the show today. And I'll tell you, this really is, it's a big one for so many people, millions, millions of people. You know, I was pulling some numbers before the show and did you know that up to 15 percent of women will struggle with acne as adults not just a teenager's condition at all so we're going to be getting into that with dr cole carney in just a little bit but first let's get caught up on the latest happenings here are your health headlines for thursday september 3rd 2020. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is telling state leaders to be prepared to distribute coronavirus vaccines as early as November 1st. The initial rollout will be limited to healthcare workers and those most at risk for the virus, but some officials are expressing concern that the fast-tracked vaccine may not yet be safe as it has not yet fully completed clinical trials. And the coronavirus by the numbers now Wednesday, more than 40,000 new cases reported in the U.S. as the total number of infections surpasses 6.1 million. And while infection rates are again trending upward in more than a dozen states, nationwide over the last week, cases are actually down 4 percent, deaths down 7 percent. In other news, an insurance company in Slovakia is poised to become the first of its kind to recommend a comprehensive plant-based treatment program for type 2 diabetes. Dovera first tested what is known as the Natural Food Interaction Protocol back in 2018, finding more than 80% of patients were able to come off of all medication following the 22-week program. The program's founder tells Plant Based News that even 40% of those who followed the program for just eight weeks were able to discontinue their medication as well. Here in the U.S., the annual total cost of diabetes is believed to be $325 billion. And finally, when it comes to the popularity of vegan diets, the UK is king. Food industry website Chef's Pencil crunching some numbers based on searches on Google, finding UK residents are most hungry for plant-based information. Australia comes in second, Israel was third, while Austria and New Zealand round out the top five. The US ranks 12th, and the city of Bristol, England takes top honors overall. All right, here's for Bristol. Moving on, there is an old saying that if you look good, you feel good. And so often you look in the mirror, you see that blotchy skin, and it can just leave you feeling in the dumps. But my guest today says the best way to ditch those dumps is to ditch the dairy. She is the founder of Core Integrative Naturopathic Medical Center in California, and she is here today to share how dairy is scary for your skin. With that, please welcome Dr. Preeti Kolkarni to the exam room live. Dr. Preeti, thanks so much for being here. Hi, Chuck. Happy to be here. It's been such a long time since you were on the exam room podcast. What's it been? Close to two years you were on. You were actually uh, really uh, instrumental in, in helping Erico Gray with his tremendous weight loss success. So I'm so thrilled that you're back here again. Well, thank you for having me here. And it actually, it wasn't that long ago. It was just last year. But after the whole pandemic, it always just things just seem way long in the past. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, calendars are completely irrelevant at this point, aren't they? Yes, they are. <laughs> it's, uh, everything's being categorized into pre-COVID and in the COVID era. We are not post-COVID yet. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about the topic du jour here and dive into dairy and the skin. So how do you define healthy skin and why is that important beyond just uh, being a cosmetics issue? That's a great question, uh, Chuck. And that's the first thing I always tell my patients who come in with skin complaints is what does healthy skin, skin mean to you? And for most people, healthy skin is something that glows or, you know, they have this 
um, out of this world idea about glowing skin, clear skin, and all of that's fine. Yes, you definitely want skin that's clear, but what's also important is not just how it looks, but how it feels uh, and how it functions. Often people forget that skin is actually one of your organs and that its health is dependent on many different factors. So anytime you have any type of rash or any eruptions on your skin, including something like acne, there has to be a little bit more of a systemic approach. And what, what I mean by that is you do need to look at various factors that affect your skin, not just your diet and not just your exercise um, and not just what's happening on that particular part of your skin. You definitely need to take, at it, take a look at it from many different factors. And when you talk about healthy skin, it's, uh, you know, we, when patients come in, the first thing we look at, yes, how does it look? Any obvious signs of disease or, you know, hypopigmentation or hyperpigmentation, any type of rashes, any eczema patches, uh, acne, rosacea, all of those things are the first things to look at. But what we're also looking for is how does the skin feel? Uh, the texture of the skin is important. If you have really dry skin, then that can indicate some hormonal issues. Uh, or maybe perhaps you're not absorbing your fats very well. Uh, also, aging skin is typically uh, skin that loses its elasticity, and that's something that I'm always looking for. Something simple that even people can do at home, you know, we always um, have patients put their hands up, and then we pull their skin up and see how fast it goes down. And that's something that's an easy test for how healthy your skin is, really, in all respects. So it's appearance, but also how it feels uh, and how elastic is it. And also, um, the reason for that is that all these factors actually tell you how much of a good barrier it can be to outside things, because that is one of the major functions of the skin is to kind of keep you safe from the outside world. It also helps to regulate your temperature. It either keeps you warm or, you know, and it tells you when, when it's too cold and you always feel like, you know, people always say, oh, my skin, I could tell that, you know, you feel your hair standing up on your skin. And that's when it's too cold. So your skin is also a sense organ. It tells you if things are not good for you. If the wind is really bothering you, then your skin is going to tell you. So even uh, too much heat or too much cold, that's something that your skin tries to protect you against. It will signal to the brain, you need to be out of this area, you're not doing well, or you need to put on a jacket, whatever it is. So it is communicating to your brain. At the same time, the skin is very important. Uh, it's a very important barrier against microorganisms. It doesn't want bacteria, viruses to enter, um, enter into your uh, body. And your skin is your first barrier. Only when this barrier is compromised, that's when you end up seeing infections like a staph infection or a fungal infection. Um, and of course, acne, which is always, almost always, um, you know, correlated with having something called the short name is P. Acne, which is a type of bacteria that you often find in the skin uh, for people who have the acne. So all that being said, when you want healthy skin and the skin that actually looks good, um, you want to make sure that the skin is actually healthy inside out, not just how it looks on the outside, but how it feels and how well it's doing it all, all its different functions. And, and there, you know, as you just said, there are a lot of factors that go into healthy skin here. But today, let's talk about dairy. It, when, in terms of, you know, detrimental factors to the skin, you know, risks for having unhealthy skin, where would you rank dairy? Is that close to the top of the list? Actually, Chuck, I put it at the top of my list, always. Anyone coming in with skin issues, that's the first thing that goes out of the diet. And the reason is, you know, the if you really look at the data and research studies, there's a very mixed, um, there are very mixed results that you see. Some say that dairy is inflammatory, others say dairy is not inflammatory, or there are studies that show that low-fat dairy uh, doesn't cause as much inflammation, whereas regular dairy or whole milk-based uh, products will cause inflammation. Then the reason there is such a, you know, difference in the data is because it always, always, almost depends on who's conducting the study. But even if we look at the studies that are non-biased um, or conduct are conducted in a non-biased way, there's still that mix. And often I find that it's because when these studies are eliminating dairy. They're eliminating dairy, but they are not. Uh, so they are taking away something that's inflammatory, but not necessarily adding things that are anti-inflammatory. And when you look at dairy and skin association, especially with things like acne, and you mentioned some statistics in the beginning, and they, it's the same thing. Acne is one of the most common things that we see in our practice too. And if you look at the numbers, they're just staggering. In fact, uh, I'd written an article about acne last year, and the total cost of acne treatment combined with the loss of productivity for acne comes to about 1.2 billion per year. That's a huge number. Just, and for, acne. Loss, just for acne. And this wow. is not even exactly, not even it, uh, counting psoriasis or eczema or any of the other conditions. And this is, uh, and when I say loss of productivity, it's because when it's your skin, people are so conscious about their skin, right? It's your first 
uh, your first contact with the outside world. And people are so conscious about how they look and how their skin looks in front of their audiences or in front of their coworkers and family and friends. That's often a reason for why people take time off of work because they have this big zit or their skin just looks horrible and they can't attend uh, or they can't perform in their, um, I have some patients who are dancers or they're stage performers. They need to you know, take time off because it's not something they can hide with makeup. So it is something that has a really major impact, not just on your physical uh, skin, but also on a mental, emotional level, acne and even other skin conditions that affect the way you look can have a very debilitating effect. So when it comes to food and uh, skin conditions, the first food to go out is dairy. And the reason is because there's so many, there's so much data and you really have to look at food data. I always tell my patients, you know, with randomized placebo controlled studies, as useful as they are for cause and effect relationships, often with food, we have to look at epidemiological studies or observational studies, because you really then see the whole picture. You're not removing or eliminating just one food. What you're seeing is how uh, ha having that food in your diet or not having that food in your diet in the environment that you live in, how does that function? And if you really look at uh, patients who have the least amount of dairy in their diet, they typically have better response or less skin issues, first of all. And when they eliminate it, they tend to have uh, a good response, even in as short as four to six weeks. Typically, when you look at dairy, you're always thinking of, you know, patients are thinking of calcium or protein. Uh, but they have done studies, and again, epidemiological studies in areas like Hong Kong and China, where the, the intake of dairy is very low. At the same time, the incidence of eczema and a lot of other skin conditions that we see here with people is quite low as well. At the same time, they don't have issues with low bo bo bone mineral density. They don't have the same rates of osteoporosis or osteopenia that we see in the U.S., where the amount of dairy consumption is really much, much higher, almost 10 times higher than what you see in uh, countries like Asian countries like China or Japan even. I want to go back to something you said there as far as how quickly somebody might see improvement. So here's a question that mm -hmm. I think maybe somebody is wondering is that, you know, if they've been drinking whole milk their entire life, well into their 30s, develop some skin issues, but then ditch the dairy, How, you know, is it that four to six week window before they start to see improvements and can that completely reverse the damage that's been done? Not always. And something important in your question, you said somebody who's been eating dairy for 30 years and then takes out dairy for four to six weeks, that's not enough time for the body to actually undo the damage that's been done so far. Also, we have to always, like we say, we always look at the whole picture. When you're looking at the whole picture, dairy might be just one of the inflammatory foods that they're eating. And taking it out, they might see some benefit, but what they also have to do is they also have to make sure that the inflammation actually calms down. And when we say inflammation, this is something that, you know, um, we often bring up with patients. What do you, what do you think inflammation is? And a lot of people are lost. They're not sure what it is. And what we tell them is that when inflammation is acute, for example, if you get a cut or a bruise, that's what you're seeing is that that bruise is an infl inflammatory process. It's meant to actually heal your body. However, when you end up having chronic inflammation, what it does is it's depleting your body of nutrients because the inflammation just keeps going and going and going and the healing doesn't happen. And that's one of the things that dairy does is when you're eating it and you're not digesting it, you're creating this kind of chronic inflammation inside your digestive system, which then translates to the other parts of your body, including your skin. And I often kind of um, use this analogy of, you know, inflammation kind of being like a wildfire. And it's very, when it's very low, it's not causing damage, but it is a wildfire. So it can pretty much translate, it can go anywhere in your body. For some people, it shows up on your skin. For others, it might show up in their joints as rheumatoid arthritis. For other people, it might show up in their, uh, in their bones and where they see osteopenia because it's leaching the nutrients out of their bones. So it's pretty much inflammation can affect any part of your body when it is present. And when you have something like dairy that you've been eating for so many years, that inflammation is started, so the wildfire is spreading, but at the same time, you, so you've eliminated something that's feeding the fire, which is the first step, right? You're not adding any more fuel to the fire. But what about the fire that's already there? You might need to do something about that. And that's where you need to speak with your doctor and figure out what is it that can help calm down the inflammation that's already present. And typically when we do that, we see faster results. And during those four to six weeks, sometimes, you know, what we'll see is, you know, the patient will report things like, since we're talking about acne, um, I don't have any more new breakouts. 
that's often something that we'll hear from patients is I still have the old remaining breakouts. I still have the old scars, but what I'm seeing is not as many new breakouts. So that's always a good, um, you know, it's a good milestone to hit that you're stopping the disease in its track. So you're not letting it, you're not adding to it further on. So four to six weeks is the most common time when you'll see some effect of getting off the dairy, but it's not, it's definitely not enough time to reverse all the damage that's being done. What about, uh, let's talk about some other conditions. We've mentioned acne a, a few times, um, but what, what about something like dermatitis, which affects, I believe, one out of every 10 people during their lifetime? I mean, it's just such a, a huge problem for so many people. Dairy is also a big trigger for dermatitis. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, most people know dermatitis as uh, more commonly as atopic dermatitis as eczema. Uh, that's the common name. And people often uh, come in saying, you know, I had eczema as a child, then it resolved, and then it's back again. That's a very common scenario that we see. And the question that goes along with that is, how is dairy affecting me now when it wasn't affecting me all these years? And my answer to that is I always tell patients everybody has a different threshold in their body for how much your, how much um, abuse your body can handle with regards to the foods that you're eating, how much inflammation it can keep under control. And once it reaches that tipping point, that's when you start seeing things show up on your skin. And that's when you'll start seeing these rashes appear or um, even things like eczema that will start appearing. So it's not that you were you didn't have a problem with dairy all these years, your body was just keeping it under wraps. Our bodies are meant to be resilient, our bodies are designed to adapt to things. So your body take, you know, takes up all the nutrients it can and tries to defend your, itself, like it's trying to protect itself and trying to get rid of the dairy. You might have signs like diarrhea or stomach cramping, uh, which are all signs of the body saying there's something inside that I need to eliminate. I don't need this in my body. But often people attribute that to something else. They think it's not the dairy. It might have been something they ate that caused food poisoning, or it could have been spicy foods or something else, but not dairy. And uh, but they, so they keep eating the dairy, and eventually the body reaches a point where it can't handle the inflammation anymore, and you start seeing it. With eczema, the very or dermatitis, um, it can be contact dermatitis, so you can have skin that is sensitive. Maybe there are areas of your skin that didn't uh, grow appropriately, the, it doesn't have all the layers of the skin or adequate fat even, um, or even adequate amounts of hydration. So like dry skin is more prone to eczema. And that can also be an issue because what hap what's happening there is the reason you're having contact dermatitis is as we talked about the skin as a barrier. The skin is also a barrier for mechanical forces. And sometimes when that barrier is compromised, you will see rashes. So people tell me if I wear tight clothes or if I wear tight jewelry, I'll see a rash. And that's, um, that's contact dermatitis. It only happens with the contact with a specific thing. Um, it can be a specific metal. A lot of people have um, allergies to things like nickel um, in their you know, artificial jewelry. Sometimes they, it's uh, because of you know, something in their phone. Or in fact, recently we're dealing with uh, people who are allergic to uh, some of the disinfecting uh, disinfectants that we're using now because they're everywhere and there are different disinfectants being used and patients have never had issues um, they're coming up. So those are different because that's something that's related to one specific uh, cue, which is either contact or a very specific thing that causes an allergy. And you might have allergy to one or two things. But when you start reacting to multiple things, and when you start reacting to almost everything, and that makes your life difficult. And that's when we really have to figure out what's happening on the inside. And that is true, including for eczema and other skin diseases that you really have to treat it inside out. So you really have to figure out what's happening on the inside that's causing your skin to show this inflammation on the outer side. And having um, a dermatitis, of course, predisposes you to having um, further infections, like staph infections are very common in people with dermatitis because their barrier is compromised. You will see that dry skin, you, they, they tend to itch more. So if they're itching and they can't control their itching, uh, they are spreading you know, the bacteria from their nails going into their skin. And that's when they become more uh, prone to having skin infections. So definitely dermatitis is, and in fact, dermatitis is now very common in children. Mm -hmm. And uh, most children, as you know, are force fed sometimes by their parents saying you need to have your three glasses of milk a day, you need to eat your cheese, you need to be eating, you know, uh, yogurt, because it gives you probiotics, which is another huge topic. Uh, but 
you know, kids are fed dairy much more. And an average American, you know, if you really think about it, they wake up in the morning, they're having cereal, milk with their cereal. They're eating bagel and cheese for breakfast. Then for lunch, they might have a salad that has cheese in it or a sandwich that has cheese in it. In the evening, they might have sour cream with their tacos. So there's dairy that's constantly there. And with this constant exposure, you're just adding to that inflammation. Oh, yeah. And that's where we see. Every day. Every day. Right. That's so your body doesn't get a day. chance. That's the American way. But let, let, let me ask you this, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I need to make sure that we get this one in because, you know, it's September. So fall is here and a lot of people are already looking ahead to the winter mm -hmm. time and they're saying, my goodness gracious, you know, my skin dries out so badly in the winter. If they last winter, the winter before, you know, they've been really big on eating that cheese, drinking that milk like you were just talking about. If they take that out of their diet, how likely do you think it is that they'll see some improvement with their skin this winter? They might see some improvement. And again, we have to look at it from both a systemic and a local perspective, too. If their skin is really damaged, they might actually need some immediate local treatment uh, where, you know, they can speak to their dermatologist or if it's not that bad yet. Uh, you know, we often recommend to our, our patients using mild oils like coconut oil or even just, um, you know, the mild uh, moisturizing lotions with ceramides that can help create or build that barrier on the skin again. And they do need to, for somebody who has really damaged skin or really dry skin, you do need to treat it both locally and systemically. So while they're doing that, applying the lotion, and also, you know, a lot of uh, moisturizers, what they're doing is they're creating an additional barrier. Again, it's not that they're necessarily adding moisture to the skin, but they're actually creating a barrier where the skin stops losing its um, water content. So it's not dehydrating the skin anymore. That's that's the point of putting moisturizers on. And that's why the best time to put them on is right after you take a shower, because that way your skin is still moist and you can just dab on your moisturizers. That's one of the great ways of keeping your skin from drying out. But if you've had dry skin for a long time, that kind of indicates, you know, we need to look at a couple of different things. Maybe they're not absorbing their fats very well and they're not using those fats for keeping the skin barrier healthy. Uh, maybe they don't have enough vitamin D in their diet. Maybe they lack other nutrients that are needed for skin hair, skin um, skin health. Uh, vitamin A, for example, vitamin C, which is also very important for keeping the collagen in your skin tight. At the same time, they might be somebody who just doesn't eat very well. So you know, and on top of that, so now they've just eliminated dairy, but they haven't actually added the nutrients that they need to be able to get their skin back to good health. So we need to do both, and that's when they'll see the maximum benefit. So coming up to this winter. Definitely moisturize, but also make sure that you know you're eating the healthy foods. And in winter, one you want to do, one thing that you want to do with your skin is definitely moisturize. But also, you know, people who live in harsher climates. I used to live in Toronto and Canada before, and the winters are brutal. Um, you definitely need to have you know extra um, extra nutrients in your diet that protect you against dry skin. And that could mean you know maybe having eat some healthy healthy fats in your diet during the winter time. It is also a way to create a little bit more heat in your body. So that those are the things that you want to focus on, not just local treatment. Right. And of course, yep. take off the dairy. <laughs> Yeah. If you have a question for Dr. Cole Carney, go ahead and post that in the comment section. We're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag right now, as a matter of fact. And Dr. Cole Carney, the first question is actually from quite a few people who are uh, wondering about hair loss and what effect dairy might have with that. Is there any connection between the two? I haven't seen any research specific to dairy and hair loss, but as you know, like, you know, our hair follicles are uh, rooted in our skin. And typically we do find that with patients with things like dermatitis or even with psoriasis, uh, we often find it on the scalp. And when the skin is damaged, the hair tends to be, the hair follicles tend to get damaged and you do see increased hair falls. Uh, hair fall in patients who have uh, conditions like eczema or psoriasis. We often also see the skin is dry for patients who, who have um, hypothyroidism that's untreated. So we do want to make sure that you treat the underlying condition. And so basically what's happening with hair fall is it depends on how healthy your hair is. Also depends on how healthy your skin is on the scalp. And if your scalp is unhealthy, you are bound to have some effects of that on your, uh, on how well your hair grows, uh, whether you're going to lose it at the same time, the texture of your hair too. Those are all the things that will be affected if you're, if the skin on your scalp is affected. All right. Oh boy. They are pouring in now. Uh, this question is yeah. from 1224. It comes from Jean. She wants to know, does coffee affect our skin or our health in general? It's her only vice, she says. <laughs> well, you know, coffee has, it's a very, um, 
it's a very broad topic, but it depends on how much coffee, first thing. If you're if you're an excessive coffee drinker, and by excessive I mean more than one cup a day, and your cup should be um, for the best comparison, like a tall from Starbucks, that's the size, like that's it. If that's all you're drinking, then it may or may not be having an impact on you. But at the same time, if that's all the coffee that you're having, but you're also not uh, eating enough nutrients to make up for the coffee, coffee can be dehydrating. Uh, coffee can also leach calcium from your bones. It can leach important nutrients from your uh, diet. Um, so all of those factors matter. It depends on how healthy you are and all of that will affect how much coffee is allowed for you. Yes, there is some data that shows that drinking too much coffee can actually make your skin look sallow. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because it is leaching nutrients from your body. Oh my gosh, that doesn't sound like a whole heck of a lot of fun. Uh, okay, uh, Cheryl at 1220 wants to know, can cinnamon or turmeric cause adult facial breakouts? Do you know of any connection between those two specifically? In fact, uh, most of the data points in the opposite direction, typically turmeric or uh, cinnamon or uh, turmeric, which the extract is known as curcumin, both of them tend to be helpful in some ways uh, for adults. The cinnamon, because it actually helps regulate blood sugar levels. And that is one of the things that has been closely associated with, uh, so like we mentioned, like with the skin, we have hormones playing a role in the health of your skin. We have your gut playing a role in the health of your skin. And of course, external and environmental exposures playing uh, a role in, your, in the health of your skin. When we're talking about the gut uh, and the hormones, both of these are affected because uh, both curcumin and cinnamon uh, can decrease inflammation in the gut, but they can also help, uh, the cinnamon especially can help regulate your blood glucose levels, which affects your insulin. And therefore, if your glucose levels are more stable, you're less likely to have breakouts on the skin. All right, next question comes to us from Leona at 1221, wants to know, what about a person that eats a lot of nuts? Can that cause skin problems like psoriasis? So with nuts, uh, it is a different um, category of food. It doesn't necessarily, you, we can't really say that nuts cause psoriasis, right? Uh, but what might be happening is psoriasis is an inflammatory reaction. It, it's, a, it's an inflammatory disease, and it is in fact classified as an autoimmune disease, where your skin, the, the inflammation has gone to the point in your skin where it's now attacking its own cells. That is the definition of an autoimmune disease. And when you have such full-blown inflammation, sometimes some foods, Dairy is definitely there for one. There are some other culprits like gluten. Sometimes soy can be up there. Corn can be up there. And nuts kind of are in that middle category. You might be, if you are one of those people who's sensitive to nuts, it can, depending on when you eat it, it can actually add to the inflammation rather than take it away. Now, generally speaking, nuts are a healthy group. But as we've been seeing, you know, lots of nut allergies are popping up and a lot of people are sensitive to nuts these days. So there might be something to the quality of nuts that is being produced. But at the same time, it's also how much, how many nuts you're eating. Again, it's always that kind of, I like to call it the Goldilocks rule. If you're eating too much or too little of something, you're always going to have a problem. So you really need to figure out with your doctor. One of the reasons that uh, nuts can be problematic is because they are a really high uh, histamine releasing food. So people who are prone to allergies, histamine release can be really intense and that can aggravate symptoms that you already have. So even though they're not causing the symptoms, they're actually just adding, again, it's that fuel to the fire. So they might, they can be pro-inflammatory for some patients. Goldilocks. That's a solid reference right there. Uh, okay, time for just a couple of more questions. This one comes to us from Jory at 1226. Wants to know, do sugar and oil also affect acne? Sugar is often thrown in there when, when it comes to pimples. Yes. And uh, that is something that's been shown over and over. And there's a lot of research to back that up. Uh, we often see that uh, people who have in imbalance in their sugar um, sugar regulation. So again, we talked about insulin sensitivity earlier. When you do have insulin sensitivity that's lowering, meaning that you're becoming insulin resistant, we often see people, we often see acne as one of the um, outside picture in the patient. At the same time, insulin resistance can also indicate there are other hormonal imbalances that might be happening. For uh, women, we typically look for something called PCOS or polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome where one of the characteristics of that syndrome is that you have insulin resistance. And typically we see acne on the face or on the back. We also see facial hair growth and other uh, things that come with the acne. So in those cases, we definitely want to eliminate the sugar um, and keep that diet hypoglycemic. And this is when, since we're talking about dairy, 
a lot of patients are sometimes they um, read up online or they find that, oh, I can't, uh, I need to follow a low glycemic diet. That means I can drink uh, or and a low fat diet so I can drink skimmed milk or I can use skimmed milk products. The problem with a lot of skimmed milk products is that they are high in sugar. Just to make them taste better, a lot of times when you're removing fat, um, you know, the other compensation is to add sugar so that it feels good to eat. And that's not serving their purpose. So often I say, get the dairy out first, take the sugar out. Um, and I have patients who, you know, you can still use some forms of sweeteners, like you could still eat fruit. Uh, you can, you definitely can eat, um, you know, uh, as many bananas as you like. That's a question I always get. And at the same time, you can uh, eat dates. You could eat uh, maybe some forms of agave nectar in your baking. Uh, you could also use date sugar in your baking. So you don't have to necessarily eliminate all forms of sugar, but definitely refined sugar is one. With regards to oil, yes, it is an added fat. And whenever you're eating added fat, it can end up in places. It's not that that fat is directly going into your skin, but what's happening is your body is having a hard time digesting the fat, similar to what happens with dairy. When you eat, uh, dairy is actually very rich in saturated fats. So when your body is trying to digest it, it's creating more inflammation in the gut, which translates to inflammation on your skin. So if you are somebody who is unable to digest fats properly, then when you start eating, when you eat a lot of oils, it typically translates as more inflammation and that's what you see on your skin. So yes, if you, you do need to look at oil and sugar as potential um, things that can add to inflammation. All right. Final question comes to us from Kathy wants to know, what can we do to make sure that the skin stays nice and elastic into old age? Excellent question. I was waiting for that one. <laughs> I often get, uh, I often get always at least one question about anti-aging. And I always say you don't want to anti-age because anything you do anti to the body, the body doesn't like it. There's a reason changes happen in the body at a specific time. So whatever you want to do is to support that stage of life in your body. You don't want to go anti things too many times. So what you want to do is uh, you definitely want to make sure that you're eating your foods, healthy foods, which is tons of fruits and vegetables. Uh, you have less uh, animal-based foods and more plant-based foods in your diet. And at the same time, when you're looking for elasticity, you want to, you know, I, this is the thing, you have to think of going dairy-free as the foundation or as the first step. So it's your first step, you've eliminated something that's adding inflammation to your body. The next step is to make sure you optimize your nutrient absorption by making sure that you're actually, one, you're eating healthy, so you're adding healthier foods, you've taken away the inflammatory food, you're adding uh, anti-inflammatory foods like fruits and vegetables, herbs and spices that help you keep the inflammation down. At the same time, you're making sure that you're absorbing those nutrients. Because if you have a gut that's sensitive, if you are somebody who's prone to IBS or somebody who has always had digestive issues like heartburn, uh, even just bloating and gas, there might be something you might need some additional help in absorbing your nutrients. And that's what you need to investigate and work with your doctor uh, so that you're then getting your nutrients and then you're healing your skin and keeping it healthy is more uh, is very important because the healthier it is, the less aged it will look. So the elasticity and uh, the you know texture of your skin will remain healthy as long as your diet is healthy. That's the foundation. Your lifestyle is healthy. And then of course, you know, there's so many other things like we talked about. Uh, make sure you use sunscreen when you're out in the sun for longer than two hours a day. Um, or if you're, you know, um, if you're somebody who plays a lot of sports, then you definitely need to make sure that when you rinse off your sweat, you want to moisturize, you want to make sure. Uh, I have a lot of swimmers who come in and their hair and skin is completely dry because they don't take the right amount of care uh, because they're always in chlorinated water. So they do need to wash off and make sure that they're putting on the right moisturizers. At the same time, of course, we're taking care of their diet. So depending on, of course, your lifestyle and your needs, there are so many things you can do for your skin to stay healthy, not anti-age, but age slowly and in a healthy manner. Um, that's well, what I would like to say for about aging skin. Yeah. All right. Well, there are a lot of questions I'm sure that many people still have to ask. And if they want to get in touch with you, they can uh, actually do that, especially if living in California. What is your website, Dr. Cole Carney? So our website is uh, coreintegrative.com. And uh, if they want to come in and uh, see us, they can always request a free consult. We always like to speak with our patients first and see if we can help them figure out what their concerns are. And if you have either skin related or other concerns that we can handle going dairy free and increasing your plant-based foods, definitely uh, send us a note and then we'll, uh, we'll get in touch with you to set up a time. 
Right. And you can also join our newsletter if you like for uh, additional tips on, you know, how you can go dairy free without having to worry about your calcium, for example, um, and tidbits like that. That's something that we send out at least once a month. And they can sign up for that at coreintegrative.com as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, oh. they can do that on the website. Perfect. Dr. Preeti Kolkarni, thank you so very much for your time today. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck, and hope you have a good day. You as well. Dr. Preeti Kolkarni, if we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and try to get you an answer on a future episode. So keep on dropping those in the comment section, or you can always tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. Before we get out of here, I got to remind you that we have a brand new episode of the exam room podcast out today, where we revisit a conversation that we had uh, on the exam room live with uh, Victoria Moran earlier in the week. And, you know, she is someone who lost 60 pounds almost 40 years ago and has managed to keep every single one of those pounds off. So she and I got an opportunity to kind of uh, compare the secrets of weight loss, what it really takes to not just lose weight, but to keep it off long term. A great conversation. So head over to Apple podcast, look for the exam room podcast by the physicians committee, download that and get yourself educated on that. There's also a great episode out this week, a conversation with Adam Sud overcame addiction substance abuse, now studying the effect of a plant-based diet. What effect that might have on people as they recover from their own substance abuse issues. It's called the infinite study. So we talk all about that. So head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you get your favorite shows from, hit that subscribe button for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And if you would be so kind as to also leave a five-star rating. On tomorrow's broadcast, Dr. Jim Loomis will be back. You know him. He is the director of the Barnard Medical Center and a featured player in the Game Changers documentary. Now, perhaps the most watched documentary of all time. He will be here to answer your diet and nutrition questions as well. But until then, we're out of time for today. My thanks to the crew behind the scenes that makes this magic happen. And to you, my exam roomie, for tuning in a huge debt of gratitude. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for watching. And remember, Stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.